Um, I'd like to first introduce, of course, Malachi Brown from the New York Times. He's senior story producer on the visual investigations team. Next to him is Aliom Leroy, open source investigative journalist with both Bellingcat and BBC Africa Eye. And to my far right, Hani Farid, professor of computer science at Dartmouth College. And very luckily for all of us here at UC Berkeley, we'll soon be joining the faculty as I believe July 1. Um, and of course, his expertise is in deep fakes. So to have a group of three individuals who really are pushing the boundaries of how we find information online and how we begin to have some degree of faith in facts in a time where fake news and misinformation and disinformation is really grabbing the headlines um, is, a, is a great opportunity. I think one of the powers, well actually I should back up just a second. The last panel obviously focused on how you investigate the tech companies. This one really turns that on its head and looks at how can you actually get information from those tech companies using some of those open source investigative methods of getting onto people's Facebook pages, of watching and observing their Twitter feeds, of grabbing content from YouTube, and using that to help tell the stories of what's happening in the world in often inaccessible places. When we began at the Human Rights Center really working in this area about five or six years ago, um, at the time, a lot of people were saying, this is only ever going to be good as corroborating information. It's going to actually maybe be used to shore up what sources are telling us, what witnesses are saying in courts of law. I think the shift in the last year or two has really been to recognize that there's a much greater potential here, at the same time that that potential comes with extraordinary risks around getting it wrong. So with that, I'd like to start with Maliki. And Maliki, if you can tell us a little bit about what you do, what visual investigations are, how you came to do them, and then we'll be watching a video to give you a very concrete example of the type of work that they're now doing at the Times. Yeah, um, uh, <clears throat> visual investigations are essentially the collection of um, any type of visual evidence, be it satellite image, um, Instagram post, a uh, cell phone video, uh, wire photo photograph, uh, could be audio material, police scanner, um, fire services scanner, um, or leaked audio uh, that we might receive. And it's the an analysis of that, usually in bulk, um, to try to, um, I suppose, bring out facts that might otherwise not be uh, found or realizable, and then connect those dots to answer basic journalistic questions. So, you know, um, who carried out a, a, a chemical weapons attack in Syria? Um, and, and, uh, and you might break that down into sub-questions and how can we find that out through the visual evidence and, and whose side of that story do, do the facts support? Um, uh, for instance, um, yeah, I did an investigation in, in Gaza uh, where there was a killing of a young medic in a chaotic uh, protest um, along the, the border boundary with uh, Israel and, and Gaza. And through uh, 3D modeling and placing videos, eyewitness videos, into that model, we were able to freeze that moment and analyze it uh, minute by minute, uh, leading up to that moment and freeze that moment and analyze the space of what was going on around it. Um, so it's, it's those types of investigations, but it can also be, um, you know, less visual, but more scouring and trawling through the open web, through apps, and combining that with um, traditional reporting um, to, uh, to, to tell a story or to, to corroborate or confirm information. If you want, we can take a look at Khashoggi and maybe I can t talk through the reporting steps. That'd afterwards. be great. Yeah. Thank you. Most arrived in the dead of night, laid their trap, and waited for the target to arrive. That target was Jamal Khashoggi, a prominent Saudi critic of his country's government and its young crown prince. He is creating an environment of uh, intimidation and, and fear. Saudis are being silenced. Since his killing in Istanbul, Turkish media has released a steady drip feed of evidence implicating Saudi officials. Weeks of investigation by the Times builds on that evidence and reconstructs what unfolded hour by hour. Our timeline shows the ruthless efficiency of a hit team of experts that seemed specially chosen from Saudi government ministries. Some had links to the Crown Prince himself. After a series of shifting explanations, Saudi Arabia now denies that this brazen hit job was premeditated. 
But this reconstruction of the killing and the botched cover-up calls their story into serious question. It's Friday morning, September 28th. Khashoggi and his fiancée, Hatice Gengiz, are at the local marriage office in Istanbul. In order to marry, he's told that he needs Saudi paperwork and goes straight to the consulate to arrange it. They tell him to return in a week. It all seems routine, but it's not. Inside, there's a Saudi spy, Ahmad al Muzaini, who's working under diplomatic cover. That very day, he flies off to Riyadh and helps concoct a plan to intercept Khashoggi when he returns to the consulate. Fast forward to Monday night into Tuesday morning. Saudi agents converge in Istanbul aboard separate flights. Muzaini, the spy, flies back from Riyadh. A commercial flight carries a three man team that we believe flew from Cairo. Two of the men are security officers, and they've previously travelled with the Crown Prince. A private jet flying from Riyadh lands around 3.30am. That plane is often used by the Saudi government. And it's carrying nine Saudi officials, some who play key roles in Khashoggi's death. We'll get to Team 3 later on, and for now, focus on these men from Team 2. This is Salah al Tubeji a high-ranking forensics and autopsy expert in the Saudi Interior Ministry. Turkish officials will later say his role was to dismember Khashoggi's body. Another is Mustafa al-Madani, a 57-year-old engineer. As we'll see, it's no accident that he looks like Khashoggi. And this is Maher Moutreb, the leader of the operation. Our investigation into his past reveals a direct link between Moutreb and the Saudi Crown Prince. When Bin Salman toured a Houston neighbourhood earlier this year, we discovered that Moutreb was with him, a glowering figure in the background. We found him again in Boston, at a UN meeting in New York, in Madrid, and Paris too. This global tour was all part of a charm offensive by the Prince to paint himself as a moderate reformer. Back then, Moutreb was in the Royal Guard. Now, he would orchestrate Khashoggi's killing. And his close ties to the Crown Prince begged the question, just how high up the Saudi chain of command did the plot to kill go? So the, the, um, very briefly, the the question we had was uh, when the Turkish authorities released the names and grainy mugshots of these uh, fellows passing through um, uh, airport security, passport control, uh, who are they? What are their positions? Uh, are they known or close to the Crown Prince? And we basically whipped up a, a document uh, with the 15 names to um, scour the open web and find out what we could uh, about them. Um, and that was um, a, a, an effort um, kind of led by our team, but also incorporating sort of a broad swathe sway of the newsroom as well. Um, so we you know, found uh, details for some of them on LinkedIn got an email address uh, linked to one of their Twitter accounts. Through that email address, the doctor, for instance, um, he used to sign off his academic papers with his email address. And we got all of those uh, positions on state boards and uh, position he took in in Australia. So we got lots of color on these folks. Uh, He was a very um, uh, senior member of uh, various different medical boards and was on state bodies and uh, we also found an Arabic news article where he had um, uh, built a mobile autopsy lab where he claimed you could conduct an autopsy in seven minutes. Um, this was um, after the, the, the massive killings at the, at the Hajj, um, and so they wanted to be able to process bodies quickly. Um, things like that. Mutreb then as well, uh, he had a very distinctive looking face. and. Um, just going back through all of the, we had, we had heard from a source that they traveled to the States and to Europe, several of them with the Crown Prince, and so we went back over basically trawling through lots of old media um, uh, uh, photos and videos of that, and we found him. But that alone wasn't sufficient for us, so we wanted a, a hotel record or uh, his name on a police record or um, you know so there, some other sort of security detail that would give um, uh, a name matching the face that we knew was was his and other people in in Europe as well and so you know everybody from you know um, our New York reporter Boston Seattle Silicon Valley Houston uh, DC everywhere they traveled 
folks were working their police sources or hotel um, unions uh, sources as well. And finally, um, one of our reporters in DC, through his national security sources, got the, the thumbs up that uh, we had found the, the right him in that particular instance. Um, we got some more information as well. We you know, uh, found somebody who knew him when he was an attache in London um, and could uh, visually identify him. And so that's just some of the reporting that came together to, to bolster uh, you know, the biographical details of who these guys were. And then that combined with verifying the flight records, um, satellite imagery, tracking of flights down to like the VIP terminal versus the, the main terminal, uh, getting photographs from inside there to confirm that the photos that the uh, Turkish authorities had put out uh, were legit. And then uh, organizing it all into, into you know, as you saw, various different teams um, and, uh, and just how the whole thing came together then just to tell that story about the, the, the efficiency of it. And also, the, the, this, on this story, when those names dropped, the Saudi Twitter sphere went into overdrive. Um, and so we were picking out little bits of information. A lot of it was incorrect and people were misidentified, but some of it was good. And some of those people came on to encrypt a chat with us as well to, uh, to help us. Yeah. So what was the timeline like for pulling this together and the resources that it takes to produce something like that? Yeah, so the, we had a number of print stories leading up to this. Mm -hmm. As soon as we got Moutreb um, squared away, we wrote. Uh, David Kirkpatrick, Ben Hubbard were very uh, important in, in leading. So it was the, the Beirut Bureau um, as, as well as um, our Turkey Bureau as well were instrumental in some of that reporting. Um, uh, so I think we had a story out two days later there are various different other uh, bits of coverage uh, in the week after that. Then we had, a, um, a sort of, I suppose, our big story landed on the Tuesday afterwards, naming Moutreb and nine of the others. Um, uh, and then the, the video came together probably about a month, um, maybe three weeks after that. Mm -hmm. And so we had to collect a lot of the visual evidence and confirm that. And um, we kept reporting it out as well as, as we went. It was interesting. A lot of news organizations were sitting on little fragments uh, of information, and as that release, it confirmed another bit that, that, that you know, CNN might have or the, what Post might have, and they might confirm something that we had, and so it was a snowball effect. And when um, Moutreb was named, of course, the, the uh, Turkish authorities were holding on to more evidence, um, and then they released a lot more about Moutreb and where and when he was spotted, and so collecting all of that over the course of a month and then just organizing it kind of gave us that, um, that news piece. Great, thank you. And I think that really illustrates an important point about these kinds of investigations is that they're collaborative, they tend to be multidisciplinary, um, and they tend to be very entrepreneurial and exper even experimental, where you're bringing in people who have very different skill sets and kind of bringing those together to help create a piece like that. And congratulations, of course, to you and your team for the Emmy Award that you won earlier this year um, for the work that you did on mapping the Las Vegas massacre. Um, Alium, I think your work, particularly at BBC Africa Eye, because we'll start with that, um, does illustrate a lot of these points around collaboration and how different kinds of actors in the space are coming together to tell stories. We talked earlier today about the lines or the boundaries becoming blurred a bit around who is a reporter, who is a publisher. Um, and I know the piece that we're going to be seeing from you is really a partnership between BBC Africa Eye and, of course, Amnesty International, Anatomy of a Killing. Can you tell us a little bit about your work at the BBC Africa Eye and how you're, you're working with open source information, social media content, et cetera, and what led to this particular piece? Sure, so BBC Africa Eye is the investigative unit of, of the BBC. It was set up uh, in the summer of 2017 and we launched in April 2018. Uh, we work with 100, 150 to 200 um, freelance journalists in Africa and the, and the goal of the team is to come around um, a journalist, um, freelance journalist in Africa who pitched to us a story and come around uh, them with our expertise, whether it's open source uh, or filming or et cetera, in order, or, or storytelling in order to bring the story up with them and sort of they lead the story and we come with the expertise and then become the face of the story. Um, and that's the aim, sort of, we're supposed to produce 20 documentaries per year. And uh, within that, um, inspired uh, by the visual investigation at the New York Times, uh, my bosses decided to set up also an open source unit within BBC Africa I, to bring the sort of uh, old, rigid BBC into the 21st century. Um, and um, as a result, we've been doing sort of started to do some open source project. And as Mayaki said, we do exactly the same, whereby 
we use open source tools, satellite imagery, Google Earth, etc. cetera. Uh, also Facebook searches in order to uh, verify information we find online, connect the dots and establish you know, simple facts and answer the simple journalistic questions, which are the where, uh, the when, the who, maybe the what, and maybe the why as well, if, if, if possible. Uh, so that's a fancy definition. What it, it sort of ends up being is us spending hours and hours in front of the, uh, of the computer, um, staring at satellite imagery for hours, etc. So it's, it, it, it sounds a bit fancy, but actually in, in, in the flesh of it, uh, it's a lot of staring at the screen uh, until 3 or 4 a.m. Um, and drinking a lot of coffee in order to, to sustain that. Um, but the story we uh, worked on uh, was uh, Anatomy of a Killing, which uh, basically what happened is in July 2018, a video went viral um, on, on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, it's a very grainy footage uh, where you see um, soldiers, uh, uh, men in military fatigues, uh, walking down a dirt path, uh, two women and two young children. Um, I won't present all the video because you, you'll see um, what it is exactly, but further on they led uh, the women and the children to the side of the road, uh, they blindfold them, they force them to the ground, and they shoot into their bodies uh, 22 times. It was very horrible, horrible footage to watch, um, not because of the blood, but just seeing two women and two young children being murdered in such a terrible way, it's very difficult. Uh, and as soon as the video went viral, um, the Cameroonian government came up because people were saying it took place in Cameroon, but the Cameroonian government organized a press conference and said, no, uh, this did not happen in, in Cameroon. Uh, those are not Cameroonian soldiers. You know, it could be anywhere in the Sahel. And just using a computer from London, we, we tried to send someone on the ground, but it was impossible because it actually took place in the far north of Cameroon where there is a fight uh, between the Cameroonian government and Boko Haram, so it's very dangerous. Uh, to access, so we couldn't send someone at the end, but just using open source methods, uh, we could flesh out, basically we squeezed the video like a lemon, every piece of evidence, uh, we, we squeezed them out in order to answer where it happened, when it happened, and, and who were the perpetrators. And I must stress that, you know, you cannot do this, just one person cannot do this, and as I was saying, it's really important, the, the collaborative aspects of this investigation, the type of open source investigation, the visual investigation, BBC Africa or Big Cat does, it's very collaborative. You know, we need to work uh, with people at Amnesty, uh, with um, independent open source analysts on Twitter, that big community that's present on Twitter. And thanks to, you know, bringing all those brains together, we were able to, to, crack, um, the, 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 to crack that investigation. Otherwise, there was no way we could do it. So that was very, very good experience as well. But I'll, I'll, I'll get you to show the video now. These women and children are being led to their deaths. The soldiers accuse them of belonging to the jihadist group Boko Haram. In the final scene of this video, too graphic to show here, they are blindfolded, forced to the ground, and shot at close range 22 times. One of the women still has the baby strapped to her back. The video began to circulate on July 10th, 2018. Some claimed that this atrocity took place in Mali. But others said it was filmed in the far north of Cameroon, where government soldiers have been fighting Boko Haram since 2014. The government of Cameroon initially dismissed the video as fake news. A month later, they announced that seven members of the military were under investigation. But there has still been no official admission that these killings were carried out on Cameroonian soil by government soldiers, and there is still no guarantee that anyone will be held to account. So how can we tell what really happened here? Over the next few minutes, we're going to follow these women and children on the short walk to the end of their lives and to glean from this video the clues that tell us where this happened, when it happened, and who is responsible for this atrocity. This looks like the kind of dusty, anonymous track that could be anywhere in the Sahel. But the first 40 seconds of the film capture a mountain range with a distinctive profile. 
We spent hours trying to match this range to the topography of northern Cameroon. And then, in late July, we received a tip-off from a Cameroonian source. Have you looked at the area near Zelevet? Close to the town of Zelevet, we found a match for the ridgeline. It places the scene on a dirt road just outside a village called Krawamafa. A few hundred meters away is the border with Nigeria. The video also reveals other details that can be matched precisely to what we see on the satellite imagery. This track, these buildings, and these trees. Putting all this evidence together, we can say with certainty that the killings took place here. Less than a kilometre away, in Zelevet, we found this compound and identified it as a combat outpost used by the Cameroonian military in their fight against Boko Haram. So yeah, we just, for example, use Google Earth in order to match the ridge line. So everyone has access to it. It's open to everyone. You can today go to, that's why also we publish the coordinates. You can go yourself to that location and compare every single uh, features in the video to the satellite imagery and be able to match it. Um, we also worked on, on, we found the WEN, looking at historical satellite imagery, obviously, because over time um, an area evolved. So, you know, there were buildings that sort of were destroyed, um, buildings that ha haven't been built yet. And so by comparing this we, and also doing a shadow analysis, uh, which is a bit more complex to get into right now, but combining all of this, we we're able to say that the video took place exactly between March 20th and April 5th, 2015 precisely, and also find the perpetrators using social media investigation uh, and also the names that were put out by the government. And I think what was really interesting for me about this, this case is also that it combined, and Maraki does the same also quite often, I think, but it combined traditional journalism with open source. So without the tip-off, I think we could have spent you know, three months looking at Google Earth and never find, find the exact location. But thanks to the tip-off, it reduced the amount of work uh, by, by oh, it, it still took two weeks of going through Google Earth, because the Farnos, near the event, the Farnos of Cameroon is still a big area, so it took quite a lot of time, but it, without that tip off, we would have never be able to, to, to get to the location. Um, and obviously, the, the collaborative aspect of it, as I said before, was, was really key to the success, uh, with Amnesty providing a lot of expertise, and also people at Bring Cat uh, working, because we got many leads also of whereabouts, we needed many people to look into those different locations, and so that was really, really great. Great. And congratulations to you and your team and to Amnesty for winning a Peabody Award earlier this week for this particular investigation. Thanks. Hani, I think you work on the piece that scares many of us most, certainly myself working and trying to use some of these methods for legal accountability and I'm sure for reporters as well. Um, so I know you're particularly tackling the problem of more and more manufactured and manipulated videos going up online and the impact that that can have around our understanding of facts and what's happening in the world. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now and help it, how, you're, how that relates to journalism yeah. and fact-finding? As if your job wasn't hard enough, um, it's just about to get a lot harder. Um, the amount of misinformation, whether it's good old-fashioned uh, stories or images and now videos and audios that can be fully automatically created by artificial intelligence system is developing at breakneck speeds, and we are probably less than a year away from full automation of complete fake content. And so what I wanna do is just talk a little bit about what that landscape looks like now. Um, how, yeah, I know. <laughs> somebody, somebody always asks me, what do we do about it? And my, my, my answer is always, stockpile food and water. <laughs> um, <laughs> but before we get there, let me just start by saying, um, that there's been this term deep fakes uh, being used quite a bit. Most of you have probably heard it. I, I'm not crazy about the name, but it seems to have stuck. It's actually a handle of a, of a very annoying Reddit user um, who used technology to create non-consensual pornography. So I'm not particularly fond of giving this person that notoriety, but here it is, we're stuck with it. Um, but it is a catch-all, and I wanna just start by talking about the different types of automated fake content that we are seeing. So uh, the first is probably the most popular one that you see is what's called a face swap. So what you're seeing here on the left, of course, is Matt Damon on the SNL skit, and on the right is the same video, 
but the face of Brett Kavanaugh actually replacing that of um, Matt Damon. Um, and what's particularly good about this fake, and by the way, this is fully automatically created. So what you do is you give to an AI system the video that you see on your left, and you give it a bunch of images of Kavanaugh, which is pretty easy for somebody of, uh, that's, that's famous. And basically what the system does is it finds the face in every frame of the video and either replaces it or synthesizes a new face to make it look as if now that's Brett Kavanaugh doing whatever it was that Matt Damon was doing on the SNL skit. And because that was an impersonator, the hair and the suit and the tie, everything actually looks pretty good. Because um, it really was meant to look like him. So SNL skits are really some of the best sources of content <laughs> uh, for this. So right on, SNL. Um, so this is called a face swap. And what's important here is that there is a source video, and then you're replacing typically from uh, around the eyebrows to about the chin of a new person's face. So this can be done very effectively here. Um, if you haven't searched for it, you should search for Nick Cage face swap. It's fantastic. Um, people are just splicing Nick Cage into every movie ever, ma ever made. And this is like one great application of this technology. I think it's the only great application. Um, let's go to the next one, please. So that's the first type. Um, this is what's called an animating or puppet master. What you see on your right is, I think, a very foolish grad student messing around with likenesses of um, Vladimir Putin. Um, so what you're seeing on the left there was initially just a static image of Putin. And that graduate student there is staring at a camera, basically. And everything he does is being mimicked um, on the, the video on the, the right. So in this case, you need a single image of a single person. And they, they are the puppet. And I, the, the person on, the right, on the, your right is the puppet master. And they can animate them to do anything and say anything you want. Um, so this requires a little bit more technology because you need a, that camera there is in the software. But now you're, you don't need a lot of data here. You just need a single image of a person, and now I can animate them using this type of animation or puppet master. Uh, the next one is uh, what's now, called a lip sync. So just listen. See, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address. But someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. So what you're, it's really a sort of weird video. So what you're hearing is Jordan Peele, who does a very, very good Obama impersonation. So the audio is Jordan Peele. Uh, the video is almost entirely President Obama, except for the mouth. So this type of what's called a lip sync fake is you take the video, you take a new audio track of an impersonator or a computer synthesized voice, and you resynthesize only the mouth to be consistent with that new audio track. So literally putting words into the mouth of a former president. Um, so you can see all three of these, you know, they're all related in some sense. They're all about creating a video, full-blown video of a person saying and doing things they never said. Um, this has all been, if you will, from the neck up. Um, there is work here by um, my colleague, Alyosha Efros, um, who's doing now full body animations. So that is now you can actually have a puppet master move in a way, and now you have the entire person, not just their head, their eye movements, and their mouth, but their entire body moving in ways that as if they're being controlled by a puppet master. And all of this, of course, is being automated. So this is no longer in the realm of special effects Hollywood studios are state sponsored. You can literally go to GitHub, download a repository, and do a pretty good job. And about every three to six months, we're seeing a massive escalation in the quality of the fakes. These are all about six to nine, excuse me, six to nine months old. So things have gotten much, much better. Um, so let's just talk about, I, I think if you're like me, your imagination is already running away with you. So where is the weaponization of this? Um, so we heard in the last panel there are elections happening around the world, uh, seven in Europe this year, India, of course. We have the 2020s coming up. I don't think it takes a stretch of the imagination that technology like this, coupled with the standard fake news, could see a release of a video of a candidate saying and doing something um, 24 hours, 48 hours before an election and swing an election. I don't think that's out of the question. Um, imagine a, a video of a CEO saying our profits are down 25% gets leaked on Twitter. You have global stock manipulation to the tune of billions of dollars before anybody figures out that it's fake. 
Um, we're already seeing the weaponization of this type of technology, particularly geared towards women in the form of non-consensual pornography. So women's faces are being um, spliced um, into uh, hardcore pornography. That content, of course, is being uploaded and being distributed. And for the most part, um, linking back to the last panel, the social media platforms have said this is not our problem. I'll mention, by the way, as a side note um, that for the non-consensual pornography, that Reddit and Pornhub have banned non-consensual non pornography. And here's the question you got to ask yourself, is how bad does something have to be to get banned from Pornhub and Reddit at the same time? <laughs> not necessarily known for their high standards. So this is particularly egregious uh, weaponization of technology, particularly against women. We are worried about how it will be weaponized um, from the national security side, um, economic uh, warfare, and of course, in elections. And there is in many ways, and I think particularly for the people in this room, a more perverse problem, which is once you have this technology, and once this technology is in the hands of the average person, everybody has plausible deniability. So rewind with me, if you will, two and a half years ago, then candidate Trump, uh, audio tape releases from Access Hollywood of him saying some pretty awful things. Nobody said it was fake. Everybody apologized and tried to move on. Does anybody in this room think that if that audio came out today, he wouldn't say it was fake? I mean, of course he would. And here's the amazing thing now. He has plausible deniability. It's not an unreasonable claim at this point. And in some ways, this is the, the real tension that you all in this room are going to have, is that as videos start coming out, some of them will be fake, but everybody now will be able to claim that things are fake. And therein lies, I think, one of the biggest difficulties, because up until recently, we've been able to more or less trust video. We always knew images were suspect, right? We always knew we had Photoshop, and we, we, we treaded lightly with images. But videos, it was done, right? Court of law, standard of proof, we were done. And that burden, that, that line has started to shift very dramatically. And so now the next question is, what do you do other than stockpiling food and water? Um, so we have been thinking a lot about how you detect these types of deep fakes. And let me just tell you one thing we are working on. So this is a video, of course, of President Obama. And I'm just showing you here uh, some face tracking that we do. And one of the things, one of the great pleasures of working on this project, um, this is with a graduate student of mine, Shruti Agarwal, who's here at Berkeley, is we've been watching hours and hours of President Obama, um, which is just really great. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say why, but it's really great. <laughs> and one of the things about President Obama is he has a very distinct speaking style. And so, for example, early on, one of the things we noticed is that when he delivers bad news, he almost always tilts his head downward a little bit. And when he delivers good news, he tilts it up and to the left, um, just ever so slightly. Um, and he has these very sort of specific patterns of speech, the way he moves his eyebrows and his lips. Um, and his, his smile and how it's correlated to his head. So what we've been in the business of doing for people like President Obama is building what we call soft biometric models. And the idea here is to learn patterns of speech, eye movements, head movements, uh, facial expressions. And I don't think you'll be surprised to know that those change from individual to inv individual. Um, so for example, if I could anonymize President Obama and President Trump's face and just showed you an animation of them talking, you would have no trouble distinguishing them. They actually move in a very, very different ways. Um, so I'll just give you an example of how this we works. Always uh, what I'm going to show you in the top here is an authentic the investigation video of is ongoing. Obama. But we know that the killer was an angry and, and disturbed what you're individual on the plot who took is in time on the horizontal information axis. And, propaganda over um, the internet. and on and the vertical axis, is you're seeing sort of During the amount his of uh, his lips turning downward group and his group. head rotating about the, the horizontal axis here. And what you can see is they're correlated. That's what I was telling you the earlier. Investigation is on now, below, well, that's a lip sync fake, where the mouth is saying what you heard earlier, but it's synced into a different video. So and now, if you will, I've decoupled his mouth from his, his head. His mouth is doing one thing, and his head is doing something else. And you can see the plots no longer are synchronized with each other. They're desynchronized. And so we've been building these types of soft biometric models. We now have one for President Obama, uh, President Trump, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders. By the way, the Democratic field just keeps getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I wish just, I Biden, we gotta just stop at Biden, that's what I'm telling. That's what I told my grad student, we're stopping at Biden, I don't care who comes next. Um, so we're trying to build up these models for all of the candidates 
with the hope that when videos start coming out over the next year and a half or so, we will have a mechanism to do that. Um, as you heard earlier, that technology sort of got us into this mess, but technology is not going to get us out of this mess. It is a part of a larger puzzle of a very complex piece of investigative journalism. You know, we are playing our tiny little part here, but of course, as you heard earlier, there are many, many other things that have to work in parallel to authenticate, and I just think the world is just getting a lot more complicated. I'll add one last thing to tie this into the last panel, is that do not, do not let the social media uh, companies off the hook, because as bad as this technology is, it is nothing if it were not for the speed and the reach of the Twitters, the, the YouTubes, the Googles, and the Facebooks. So we have to hold them accountable for allowing this, this um, uh, material on their platform and for pushing it through there and profiting from it, and that is a big piece of that, this equation as well. I don't think I ever have to worry about anything that comes out of your mouth being boring. <laughs> so given that you have your techniques as a computer scientist and someone who is an expert at the forensic analysis of, of imagery, for the two of you who are really working with visual content and really pushing that field, do you worry about deep fakes? And if so, what are you doing about that? I can. <laughs> you take it, my IP. <laughs> um, in, the, in the moment, uh, well, so, so for investigations, you know, we'll take time and we'll talk to experts like Annie who have uh, the ability to, um, to sort of decode them and to look for signals like that. And, we, and we've done that numerous times. Uh, there's a whole uh, network uh, uh, of experts in, in the States uh, like Annie. But in the, mo you know, in the moment, it's part of this sort of um, information disorder that's out there which um, you know, as Carl said earlier on, you know, we should be outraged about, I mean, it is a, is a really profound societal problem. Um, and so if you can imagine a politician's um, social account being hacked and uh, some declaration being put out there, then that can go like wildfire. And, um, you know, the thing about it, misinformation or disinfo is once it's out there, it spreads and it's harder to sort of to, for the truth to get out there, um, uh, you know, there, there are people out there who still believe that the Parkland students are crisis actors, um, and uh, uh, so in that context, it is, uh, it is a problem. I, I think that's the case, and, but, but at the same time, we don't deal so much with, in, in a way, in human rights sort of investigation we do, we don't have to deal so much with people talking at, at, you know, it might be the case, for example, with the Cameroonian government a press conference, you know, maybe his face could have been edited to say something else, but for the video, the Cameroonian video, for example, you know, the speech is not a big part of that case. And so what rather is quite worry for us, and there's a tool recently that was developed by Photoshop, but I forgot the name exactly, but where you can basically Erase, uh, you know, effects. After Effects, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah they, oh yeah, con what was it? Content Aware Film. Yeah, exactly, so they developed that quite recently. Mm -hmm. And that's worrying because that means they can remove, you can remove in the video an object or a person and sort of, it's harder to detect because the technology enables sort of, the, the sort of erasing to learn from, from the space around it and sort of replicate that space, that's the background, and apply it to where the person was or where the object was. And so that's quite worrying because um, it means you need to train your eyes. I mean, there might be technology to detect it, detect, detect it sorry, um, but I haven't uh, used that yet. But so, it might, you know, it's if you're just in a rush with pressure um, and you need to re um, sort of verify that video quite quickly, you might not pick up that something is not there uh, or as it should be there. And so that's quite worrong. But yeah, deepfakes, that's, as we call deepfakes, I don't like that word as well, but that, <laughs> that's also getting more and that, that could be potentially dangerous. We don't see it yet. But I think we need to prepare, and, and as Mikey said, we really need to get going. So I'll, yeah. I'll take your number after, and we're going to have a conversation. Uh, but yeah, we need to 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 prepare for that. I, I think you raised a good point that you know deepfakes are particularly sort of startling in their power, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of ways to fake content. So Adobe just released in After Effects, which is their video editing a new technology that allows you to basically pick a spot in not just an image but in a video, and it deletes it throughout the whole video. So you can literally take a video of that soldier walking down, pick the soldier, and they remove him in, in the entire video. And so that technology, and it's not just AI powered, it's good old fashioned Photoshop and Adobe uh, products that are also being, and look, there's a lot of good uses of that technology. We shouldn't demonize the technology, but it is, being, it is going to be weaponized and it is going to be harder to trust. 
and as you said also, you know, things move fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to be 10 years ago, I worked primarily in the criminal justice system. I worked in the courts. God, I mean, if anything was the opposite of journalism. I mean, just tedious and slow and methodical, which works really well for me. Um, and, but um, <laughs> I'm an academic after all. <laughs> and, um, but you know, in the journalism space, it is fast and it is really, really hard when you can't trust things that you used to be able to trust anymore. The thing about the, just one thing about the uh, object removals, we tested this and um, I think the, the, there was a video with um, a car that we removed and, did the, and we, we did another one and we sent it out to the community um, and through the tools that you guys have, it was able to detect the scrambling of the pixels, mm -hmm. you know, of that object through the video um, and I, I wonder, you know, if Facebook can delete the Christchurch um, live stream at source could they sort of implement technologies that delete altered or manipulated media at source? You don't want to get me started on bashing on Facebook because it won't end. Um, I think the issue with the Facebooks and the YouTubes and the Twitters and the Googles is not technology, it's will. They just don't want to do it. Look, 10 years ago, we were doing battle with them for years to remove the most egregious examples of child sexual abuse material of eight-year-olds and four-year-olds and two-year-olds being raped and their videos being posted on the platforms and their response was, this is not our problem. If I can't get them to respond to this, what hope do I have in any other space? So I'm not particularly hopeful that these companies left to their own devices are going to do anything without significant legislative pressure. And I don't want to rehash the last panel, I, um, but I do feel like you know they are not, we cannot sit around and wait for them to take action, because I don't think they will. Well, and I think the, the answer that they're giving at the moment is that automation, they're catching a much larger quantity of information that really should be taken down, because it's problematic for a whole host of reasons. And I think what they're not being as clear about is what are they actually grabbing. So if they're quoting 90% takedown rates um, of problematic content, are they actually grabbing problematic content or information that really needs to be up and out there? So I don't mean to, to nitpick too much, mm -hmm. but they can't say we're taking down 90% of the content and say we don't know how much content there is out there. You can't compute a percentage without the denominator. I hate to be a mathematician about this, but wait, I am a mathematician. That is the most idiotic statement. So they have no idea how much content is staying up there. Yeah. Well, and I think that gets us to a couple of the challenges of this work, and in a few minutes we'll open it up for questions from the audience, but that's both speed and scale. So I think the speed problem you guys are pointing to, when we're talking about legal practice and using some of these methods, it's a little less concerning, as Hani, you're suggesting, because we can use more traditional methods of fact-checking and verification of visual content, like doing a reverse image search of a picture to see if it's shown up earlier on the web to use satellite imagery to see if um, it's consistent, the location that you're being told a video was shot in is consistent with what you can find on satellite imagery, we can play that out and look for that, that additional content in a way that you can't on the more social level. On the scale piece, I think with having 6,000 tweets now going out every second, the last statistics I read, and 500 hours of YouTube video going up every minute, um, you know, how you find that needle in the haystack and how you find the right information, I think, becomes really tricky. And I think with that, I'd like to turn to you, Aliom, to talk a little bit about the work of Bellingcat. Um, and because I think Bellingcat is, is a bit of an interesting beast. It's not quite a journalism outfit, but it sort of is. It's not quite an investigative unit, and yet they're trying to gather information to get legal accountability for wrongs. Can you tell us a little bit about what they're doing and how they're actually taking advantage of the scale of people being online to get the facts that they need to tell their stories? So it's true that they have, in a way, many hats. Like, as you were saying, they both sort of do, inv do investigation and, and put out reports about this investigation, almost like a media organization or also an NGO would do. But at the same time, now they're working with the ICC. Um, for example, they recently did, they, they put out recently the Yemen project, whereby they geolocate, date, and, and sort of analyze uh, airstrikes by the Saudi Gate coalition in Yemen in order for, to, to build that database that could then be used later on um, by prosecutors if there were ever to be any prosecution against, uh, which we, we, then it's a political will again, that's another question mark, but at least the database will, will, will be available for prosecutors to act upon and to use, uh, which is quite new, which you wouldn't think, like, for example, if you compare to the Rwandan genocide, where there is barely any footage of it, it's quite incredible today that we can build those huge databases. So they, do, they, they have those different uh, hats. And, 
And at the same time, they use the power of, of, of crowdsourcing and all the people available um, on, on, the, on that Twitter community that does open source investigation. And what's quite interesting um, there, and that happened, for example, also with, with the anatomy of a king, is that we end up working with people. Sometimes we don't know their real identity. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know their full name. We don't know their face. We've never met them in person. Yet we all have the same goal of either establishing the facts or, you know, or, or sort of collecting evidence or like that. It's either this, this goal or sometimes it's just the obsession, uh, yet not crazy as Ayot um, says, the founder of Bringing Cat, that's quite important. Like, we're all obsessive, but we're not ment mental or crazy people. Um, and therefore, you know, we share that, that, that sort of, um, we share that common uh, obsession and, and the willingness to establish the facts. And that's quite interesting because that's quite new, that sort of break the boundaries that you know, media organization would not normally have uh, working. You know, if you're not a journalist, then you might source or et cetera. But that with Bellingcat is sort of changing. And they've been also doing workshop in order to uh, everyone, to, because that's the beauty of open source is that anyone today can quickly learn it. The tools are quite, you know, it's not so much tech savvy. Anyone can pick them up quite fast if you have the time. It's just the time that matters really. Uh, and so they've been doing workshop in order to democratize those tools and, and allow that community to to grow and extend, whether within media organizations like New York Times and the BBC, but also to within NGOs and also for those you know, independent analysts who are really, really useful in all the investigation, either Bang & Cat, BBC, or New York Times does. Well, and I think that brings me a little bit to risks. So I think one of the areas where people have sometimes been concerned about Bellingcat's methods is the, in real time, out in public, putting up a piece of content like a photograph or a video and asking the Twitterverse, you know, can, what can you tell me about this piece of content? What if people get it wrong and that's going up and the wrong person gets accused? Can you talk a little bit about what you do to avoid some of those risks? So we try, you know, to, it's, it's a hard one because we try to have control over the content, but as soon as you put it on Twitter, it's like if you throw meat at, uh, like, you know, I don't know, southern of dogs and they start running at you and you don't, <laughs> you don't know what to do with that. Um, so it's really hard. So we try to, to, to take control and, and be able to, you know, sort of isolate the people if they get it wrong and, and quickly react in order to put what the, the, the proper information out there. But the risk also is, for example, there's a Europol campaign uh, that was uh, about uh, child uh, trafficking and child um, um, pedoph pedophilia, sorry. And there was one case where it was quite dangerous what Europol uh, did, and, and I'm sure Begin Cat might have done that mistake as well, but basically they put a picture seeking the help of the, of the community uh, they remove, the, obviously, the child in the picture, but what they didn't realize is the picture was still there available online. So if you do a simple reverse search, in like five minutes, you would get to the real picture with the child uh, present in that picture, which is you know, quite dangerous to that person, to that child, uh, and also could have dramatic effects on, 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 the, child, um, on, that, on the child themselves or, or, or risk to that person. Um, and so that's... You know, that's quite important to, to, to control, but it's quite hard in a way. I don't know, there's no perfect mm -hmm. answer to this because Twitter and Facebook, the, the speed, again, it's all about the speed. Uh, and and it's, it's quite hard to control. But we try to isolate if people get wrong and then publish information mm -hmm. uh, ahead of time. I, I think it was a great question to ask. And, and by the way, I don't think it's hypothetical. After the Boston Marathon bombing, mm -hmm. we saw exactly this problem, right? It got crowdsourced <laughs> out. People started accusing students who had nothing to do with it. Um, and not only you know, are you impacting lives, but you're actually impeding law enforcement, which now has to take effort to stop that thing. So there is power in the crowd and there is danger in the mm -hmm. crowd. And there's also, you know, just to get back to the, to the open source, I, I'm a big fan of the open source, but there's also tension that when we put our forensic tools out there in the open source, we also empower um, our adversary. And so there's this sort of the interesting sort of cat and mouse game we're playing, and I don't have a good answer for this. You know, mm -hmm. in, in the past, it's always been, look, we're a bunch of academics. The life cycle of technology at Adobe is every 18 months, so fine, we publish everything. We get smarter, they get smarter, that's the game. But now things are moving so fast. We've, had, for the first time now, started thinking, do we publish these techniques? Mm -hmm. um, or do we hold them tightly and work with the New York Times and work with Bell and & Cat and work with the organizations that we trust? And I don't have good answers for that, and I think we're gonna have to start figuring out how we navigate that space, because I, I, I think it's very tricky. 
And I think that really covers the, some of the physical security issues. And there's two other buckets that at the Human Rights Center we often talk about. And that's the digital security concern, concerns that are heightened with doing this kind of work. And also the psychological risks of watching hours after hours of really violent footage. I think there was kind of a, a sense among the broader human rights community, journalistic communities, that doing this kind of work from your desk is a lot safer because you're physically removed from the sites of violence. But I think there's a growing awareness that's coming out of a lot of the social science work looking at drone operators that watching um, really atrocious behavior up close takes its toll. So I wonder if either any of you can comment on some of the digital security concerns and also the psychological and how you're dealing with them. There have been great investigative journalistic reports on the, the, the trauma of Facebook moderators you know, who sit in a room in a dark basement for eight hours a day with absolutely, first of all, they're not even Facebook employees, so let's not call them that. They're all third party and they're treated very badly. Mm -hmm. And it takes literally days to weeks for them to have PTSD um, syndromes. They are looking at the most horrific and worst content online. And having seen a lot of that, I can tell you, it will give you nightmares. And if you're doing this day in and day out, um, maybe you don't have that physical danger that some of the people in this room have had, but the mental um, 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 damage that is being done is very real and I think unarguable at this point. Yeah, it's a study. Vicarious trauma is, uh, is studied and established as a phenomenon now. Thankfully, I haven't um, suffered it, but I've met a Facebook moderator who did and know other people who work in this space who also have. So I think, you know, if you're managing people or working with people who, who do this, um, it's about recognizing sort of when to, ro when to roll off yeah. and, um, and, and, and um, take a bit of pressure off because often when you're doing that, you know, maybe there's, there's deadline pressures and there's other things, um, you know, going on as well which can kind of exacerbate um, what you're doing. But, yeah, to give you an example, one of the stories that we did <clears throat> with, so what we try to do with the visual evidence is to prove a point. And uh, with a chemical weapons attack in Douma in Syria, um, the communications were down um, on that particular day, and so we were getting lots of fragmentary videos, little short clips of women and children primarily, but all, uh, men in the building uh, as well, with horrific in injuries. Mm -hmm. And what we needed to do, we didn't have one video going from the outside of the building through up the stairs and to where the bomb was, so we needed to c connect all of those rooms to the balcony where we created a 3D model of the thing. And our um, a former architect who works with us, uh, Anjali Singby, and one of our editors, Barbara Marcolini, went, watched over and over and over, um, charting um, architectural details and rebuilt the three-story building and plotted out where every um, person lay. I think you guys did something similar as well. Um, and that wasn't a pleasant experience uh, for them, so you, you, you recognize that and, and, and try to move, you know, move them onto something else. Um, Just yeah. to, sorry to jump on that. Yeah, it's, it's sort of, I think it's, it's hard because the fact that you sort of, you're not there, you don't get to the ground, and there's something of being there and seeing it for yourself, but you know, you, you stare at the computer, you see a video of, of two women and two um, young people, uh, two children get killed, but you have your coffee and then you've got your colleague coming up to you and talking mm -hmm. to you. And it's like those two spaces are really weird to combine. But at the same time, I just wanted to end on, you know, there are a few tips and tricks that you can put in place. Don't, don't listen to the video, don't put mm -hmm. the sound on it. That, that helps a bit. Make sure you don't watch. It's really hard, but you shouldn't watch, you know, you should watch them at work. Mm -hmm. And then when you go home, then you don't watch those videos because it's really about, you know, when, in, in, don't take those videos into your private life. And so there are ways to protect yourself and reduce the impact, but mm -hmm. you know, there's so much you can do about it. And I think for us, we have a team of about 80 student investigators that come from very different disciplines. And my colleague Phelan currently runs that team. And one of the biggest things that we do is we make sure that they get training from day one and that it's multiple times. And we really have clustered it in three buckets. The first being knowing your baseline awareness and knowing when you're deviating from it and having a no questions asked policy of switching. Second, the tips and tricks that you're mentioning. And third, the sense of community, which I think is a really underexplored and undervalued um, piece of this. And one of the things that I think students have reported back to us has the biggest impact is when you partner people up or you have a bunch of people who are working, you're watching your back, it performs a lot of the fun functions that I think we used to have when we'd go on the ground as part of a team and you had a group of people that you could debrief with that understand what you're going through. 
Um, and I, so I think that I'm just going to ask two more quick questions really quickly on the collaboration side, because I think that's where this work gets super interesting, is when you bring computer scientists who are not reporters together with investigative reporters, together with people with legal expertise, sociologists, et cetera, you can create something new and really fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit about the types of collaborators that you are working with and how that's playing out and strengthening your reporting? Yeah. Um, uh, prior to the Times, I worked with a, a news agency called Storyful, and they built proprietary software which helps uh, them find uh, the needle in the haystack that you were talking about mm -hmm. and really hone in and find evidence uh, is the way I, I think about it, and we still work with them. Um, we can show a video as well. Of, uh, forensic architecture. Uh, this is, sorry, this is our Gaza investigation where we collected a lot of videos, synced it up, also, you know, performed these um, tasks where you can kind of create a panoramic view to examine what's going on. Three uh, droned the whole area and created a 3D model out of it with Forensic Architecture, who are a London-based group, um, and then placed the videos within the model and sketched out the position of people so we could freeze where they were at that fatal moment. Um, and the, that bullet uh, hit one person's leg and, and then killed the woman in red there. Um, and so that allows you to really sort of uh, analyze what's going on in space. Was there a real threat to the fence? the distance in between the, the soldiers and, and the perceived threat at, in that moment. Um, uh, and so that was a, a months long collaboration with Forensic Architecture where we were, you know, we, we collected 1300 uh, pieces of um, visual content from directly from the devices of the people. So we went to Gaza several times directly from the devices which gave us metadata which allowed us to sync up and uh, really get a feel for what was happening that day. Uh, in addition to interviews with 60 people as well. Um, so it was a real combination of on the ground and sort of um, uh, technical forensics. Um, so CTU Research is another group that's doing that as well. And um, uh, folks in the, in the audio and vis uh, visual forensics community as well. Carnegie Mellon did some cool work on this. We got the, um, the gun shot in six different videos. And they were able to, uh, there's, a, there's a crack and there's a thud. The crack is the bullet passing by the camera and the thud is the actual retort of the rifle. And so through some whiz -bang technology, you can um, calculate the distance from each camera and triangulate that distance, which also led back here. So even though we didn't use that, it just bolstered um, the, the, the theories uh, or the, the findings that we were, we were coming to. And then maybe I'll end with, before we open it up to questions, diversity. I think that's an issue that's come up repeatedly over the last couple of days. What, um, can you tell us a little bit about the diversity of your teams and also how these methods that you're using contribute to the diversity of the stories that you're telling and or the work that you're doing more generally? Um, yes. Uh, so. One of the caveats with this type of work is that, um, you know, we're, we're getting a certain type of evidence. And, um, you know, if, if you take Gaza, for instance, I was thinking about this, this question coming in, I realized that all of the content and all, all of the evidence that we gathered were from men. And, um, and that applies in, you know, in, in different cultures, in different states, in, in, in countries where people are very, very poor, there might be one cell phone or one communications device in a family, and it might be held by, ma by, by, by the, 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 the husband or the man in the household. And so therefore, you know, these types of approaches and this type of information might not be adequate or sufficient to tell certain types of stories and just being aware of that um, uh, sort of gendered element and other uh, elements. I think, uh, we're fortunate in that we've got bureaus in lots of different places and fixers in lots of different uh, countries, and so those cultural aspects um, and considerations that come into play, we can run by people, but not everybody has recourse to that, and um, I think that's really essential as uh, finding collaborators on, on the ground uh, is one other thing. Languages, of course, um, yeah, our team is tiny, but you know, in the team we've yeah we've got multi, you know. Different, all different nationalities for Europeans. So, yeah, so those kinds of considerations. Okay, great. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think one thing we've been really um, excited about at Berkeley is the coming storm of investigators who are skilled in doing this work. I know our team is, we have some extraordinary men on our team, but we also have a predominant number of 70 to 80 percent women out of the 80 students who are working with us, and mostly women of color. So I think it's really exciting to see how that can also kind of impact this next generation of fact-finding. With that, I'd like to open it up to the audience in the back in the black jacket. And if you can please say who you are sure. when you ask. Sure. Laura Seidel, um, NPR. And um, the question I have is, how quickly will it be possible, this is specifically to, uh, it's Hani Farid, correct? Um, how quickly do you think it will be possible to develop tools that can quickly discern if video is fake or real that can be cheap enough to be widely deployed? Man, that's the right question to ask, um, which tells you I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going to hedge a little bit. Um, so if, if I could freeze technology today, I'd be able to answer that question, or at least put some bounds on it. The problem is we're sort of in uncharted territory here. So everything we are seeing with the advances of machine learning and deep learning and AI is it's new for everybody. We've never seen anything like this before. We've never seen a life cycle of technology on the order of months. It's always been in the order of years. And so if the technology, and this is a big if, and I want to sort of put that caveat there, if the technology keeps developing at the pace, I don't think we'll ever catch up. Um, we're always going to be behind. I'll give you an example of this. I had a, a former student colleague develop a technique to detect a deep fake. It took literally a week for what he was doing to get incorporated into the next generation. One week, right? So I'm hoping for six months um, now. So you know, this is very much a cat and mouse game. And I can tell you that the people on the synthesis side are about two orders of magnitude more than on my side of the fence. So there's 100, 100 times more people working to develop this technology than there are on the detection side. And so we're pretty outgunned. Um, I think that what's going to happen is that we are going to start to roll out some tools, again, trying to figure out how to roll it out in a way that doesn't arm the adversary. Um, and I think we are going to start plucking off the low-lying fruit. So the knucklehead who downloads a GitHub repository and creates a fake will knock them off. And then we'll knock off maybe the computer science grad student who knows a little bit more, and maybe she's able to create slightly better fakes. We'll knock her off. Uh, and then we'll start working our way up. But in the end, I'm going to lose. And I sort of know that. Um, but my hope is I'll lose to a smaller and smaller number of people. Um, I, I, you can tell I haven't answered your question. Um, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. Um, I think it's a little bit like an arms race. And I, I think it's, it's, there's a big X factor, so I'm not willing to make predictions. The yeah, it should be, yeah. The gentleman in the blue shirt and the glasses, second row. Yeah, you. Thanks so much, Alexa. I'm Sewell Chan from the Los Angeles Times. My question is a follow-up to the previous one. Um, if the authentication and detection folks are uh, going to always be behind the synthesis and the front and the technological frontier, I mean, is there any hope that is there any place for regulation and legislation? Are the deep fakes similar to like I don't know 3D printing of guns? Is, and, and are we risking outstripping the kind of cognitive ability to process fake information from true, which has been a dominant theme of this whole conference? It's a great question. So I can tell you, actually in your neck of the woods, the Screen Actors Guild has gotten very concerned about this technology, in particular its weaponization against their talent. Um, there are discussions here in the state of California to legislate to make the creation of non-consensual pornography illegal. Obviously, that gets, I'm not a lawyer. I think that should be clear. Um, but obviously, that gets into very tricky First Amendment free speech issues that we're going to have to navigate. Um, the thing with deep fakes is, look, there's applications that are fantastic. I mean, I love the Nick Cage uh, parodies. Um, we, should, we, should, you know, we should encourage the onion to make fun of this president. Um, but then it gets into the sort of tricky territory where it gets weaponized. And now you're talking about intent. So how do you legalize? It's not like a 3D gun, printed gun, right? There's no intent there. That, that should just be illegal. So here, there are applications of the technology that we should absolutely encourage, and there are others that we 
we are concerned about. And so how you navigate that legislatively is very tricky. Um, I will tell you there has been legislation that's been proposed here in the state. Um, also in, in D.C., I think it's Representative uh, Schiff um, has proposed legislation. I think they're all well-intended but flawed, and I think how we navigate that space is going to be super interesting. I think we are going to have to legislate at the end of the day. I'm just not sure how. In the black, yes. Yes, uh, Myron Levin with Fair Warning. Uh, who's developing these deep fake tools, and what's the market? Who are they selling this to? I mean, what's the business model? Yeah. So it's primarily academics. It's primarily my colleagues, many of them on this campus. Um, they have been doing this, by the way, for a long time. It's people in computer graphics, computer vision, um, and the primary uh, uh, target is Hollywood. Um, so for example, there's this great little startup um, where they are taking movies um, in English, and instead of dubbing them in that really awful dubbing, they're resynthesizing the mouth to be consistent with the language being spoken. And it's fantastic. It's great, it's a great application. Or for example, you wanna put a young Harrison Ford into a movie, right? You face swap him into another actor. So, so Hollywood has always been in this business. It's just been really, really tedious. So that's the primary application for it. Um, and then obviously there are entertainment and you know, applications. But I think to get to your question, and this is a conversation I've been having with my colleagues, is I think once you figure out the technology that you're developing can be weaponized, you now have a responsibility. Simply putting out there in a GitHub repository is no longer okay with me. That's not to say you shouldn't develop the technology, but now you have to start being more thoughtful about how you deploy it, who you release it to, how do you put safeguards in place, and I think this very open source, and again, I'm a proponent of open source, but once that source code can be weaponized, maybe we should think a little bit about how we develop and how we deploy it, and whether this community has the stomach for that, I think remains to be seen. Um, right here. Uh, thank you so much for doing the panel. Um, Simon Schuster from Time Magazine. Um, a couple of times in this panel, uh, the importance of collaboration has come up. Um, I wanted to ask you guys how far along we are in overcoming the kind of obsession with the exclusive and, and you know, keep keeping the information to yourself. How far along are we in, in really uh, opening up to more collaboration in, in the type of journalism you work on? Hmm. Thanks. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. It's changing for the, it's changing, it's moving fast. But I think, thanks also because, um, I don't know if, for example, the visual investigation and BBC Africa, we have very different audience, so it, Maybe the old school mindset was to keep your scoop for yourself, but I think now if, if I had, you know, something, like, my editors might be a bit resisting this, but that's changing a bit. Like, for example, quite recently, I asked about, uh, so we had an investigation in Madagascar, and I asked Maraki whether I could connect uh, some, with someone at the New York Times, and your first feeling was, <laughs> no, they will likely not be, you know, be willing to collaborate with you on this story. Um, and, and that's based on, that's, that's what we, I was assumed that was the desk, BBC desk as well, but it turned out they're really open to it. Uh, so it's, it's very those individual connecting more and more. And, and I think big investigation like the Panama Papers really highlighted the power of, of collaboration. When you get big data leaks or big amount of data, and it's the same with open source, basically you just deal with a lot of data at once. And you know, you can be working on your little piece of data and just be like, ah, I'm working by myself and, and publishing that, but the impact will be way greater if you can, first of all, reach a wider audience by, let's say, connecting with the New York Times, but also covering much more because maybe they have experts at the New York Times that we don't have the BBC or people that have more knowledge. And so that's changing um, quite fast, but it still depends on individuals making that, that jump to, to different, so I think, Within journalists, it's getting better between themselves to cooperate and working with NGOs as well and et cetera. But there's still some resi resistance above, um, but slowly but surely we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, it has to change. Coll collaboration is key, I think, and uh, we get the same pressures as well. I mean, when you guys were doing the Africa one, we had a chat about it. Um, met them over in London. Also, you know, Bellingcat did some reporting on, du a lot of reporting on Duma. You know, we built on that reporting uh, on, on, on top of that. That said, when their Cameroon piece came out that we talked about, I had a package, you know, I envied that piece, but at the same time, it's a great piece to get, to get out, you know, to get out there, to be out in the open. So, 
Um, but you look at the Paradise Papers and the Panama Papers and you know, um, the collaboration and innovation behind that, I mean, that's incredible work. Um, so if news organizations can only um, just kind of understand you know, that they have different audiences, even Carol, you know, Carol's work as well with the New York Times just created great impact in the States as well. Um, yeah. And with that, please join me in thanking our panel.